Hello, it's Scott Manley here. At the start of 2025, Boom Supersonic flew their XB1 past the sound barrier a couple of times, demonstrating that this startup company could in fact actually build a supersonic aircraft, even if it was really no relation to what they would ultimately build. Now, over the last year, we've watched as they've been in the centre of a bunch of other stories. For example, getting the rules changed to finally allow supersonic flight over the US, as long as you don't actually make a sonic boom on the ground. There's been various stories about the development and testing of their Symphony engine, the engine which will power their Overture airliner. None of the big jet engine manufacturers were going to commit to adapt one of their subsonic airliner engines to a supersonic airliner engine. And so this week, there were a couple of other stories that Boom were at the centre of, and both involved uh, high-end GPUs, let's say. First of all, the Boom XB1 experimental aircraft has been brought into Microsoft Flight Simulator for everyone to fly. Now, Flight Sim 2024 had a not entirely bug-free launch, to put it mildly, and so this came alongside a whole bunch of other fixes. This is one of the best models I have seen in the game, and I saw this aircraft up close. Yeah, I remember remarking about how the rivets on the rear section were not flush, and surely that would affect their, uh, you know, their drag, but actually it didn't. Looking, just trying to get in here, into the landing gear bay... <laughs> look, look at that! Look at the amount of detail there! That is ridiculous! None of that detail needs to be in there. Oh my god, it's like they took the actual drawings and designs for the thing and just decided to put them into the game in as many polygons as the game could deliver. Yeah, pretty much everywhere you look on this, there is like completely unnecessary detail on the models and I am totally here for that. And I'm glad that my graphics card was also up for the task. So yeah, one of the things about Flight Sim 2024 is you can do the walk around, although all these covers and stuff are all sort of linked together. You take one cover off and all the other ones disappear, so you don't have to spend forever pulling off every single cover. Again, getting in underneath this, you can see where the latches are, you can see where all the hydraulic lines, the power cable... Look, at they've got springs on there! Who puts that kind of detail into a model in a game? I'll tell you who, the people that built this. But again, this is a one-off. This is the only way most people will ever be able to fly this thing. I obviously flew the simulator when I was in Mojave. I got a few minutes to practice landing it. But uh, I, I never actually saw it fly in person, which, you know, was it was sad because I was always busy and schedules made things very hard. But I'm glad that this has sort of come forwards. There is the front gear, and if you look carefully, you can see the two cameras that are there. Because, of course, the nose it essentially obscures any visibility down to the runway. So, to get the camera, to get the view while landing, you need to use these cameras, and those are projected in the screen inside there. You see that? There's one up there, one down there. So, anyway, yeah. Now, now we've seen all the stuff on the outside. Oh look, Tristan Brandenburg Geppetto, that's right, the test pilot gets his name on here. And the detail pretty much continues when you get into the cockpit. Now when you start out on the tarmac like this, you have to use the full startup checklist, and that is available on the iPad. You know, you can just basically go through these things. If There's a little eyeball there that you can click on, but I've done this a couple of times, so I actually know where all the switches are on this. This panel down here is like the air and the power and the fuel. So airflow switch off, air temperature knob is auto, battery switch, that's under the red, that's shut. Generator switch goes on, avionics knob should be set to off. And let's skip forward to starting the engines. So yeah, start left engine first. There is a button up here you hit and that will start the auto start system. So if you look in the center, in the MFD in the center, you can see the one on the left, the percentage power is slowly increasing. The critical number for this is about 12%. While we're doing this, we're going to check our hydraulic pressure. Um, and it'll idle at about 50% once we get there. So 10, 11, 12%. That's good. Okay, so now we'll make sure our left is on idle. And we'll start going through all the other settings here. One of the things that wasn't obvious from the checklist was how you set the bingo fuel quantity. So you have to use these buttons on the side there. You select fuel and then use increment and next to change the digits. So you have a bingo fuel account amount 
actually set in there and then it will stop complaining when you try to take off with the, without that set. Now I did actually get to fly their simulator at Mojave and obviously they had physical versions of this. It was actually technically called Spaceballs, the simulator. And on the back end it was running X-Plane. So it's interesting that they have ported this to Microsoft Flight Sim instead. And while I could, in theory, push all the buttons, flick all the switches, I really never got around to that. I didn't do a full startup. We did a takeoff. We did some landings. Uh, so I have no idea how representative this is of the actual checklist that they would use on the aircraft. But I suspect it's pretty close. And so having taxied out to the runway, it's time to go through the takeoff procedure. And, uh, well, this thing needs to go very, very fast. It has skinny little delta wings. It does not have flaps. The takeoff procedure requires that you use full afterburner once you get up to speed. So initially what you do is you throttle up to like 85% while holding the brakes. Once that's there, you're going to let the brakes go. You're going to keep it on the center line. Once you get above 100 knots, you're going to fly apply full military power. At 150 knots, you're supposed to rotate and hopefully the thing will begin to take off. And of course, once you're airborne, that's when you use the, the land, bring the landing gear up and everything. Main thing is to focus keeping it sort of on the center line, you know, using your feet. And again, once you get to the speed, start to pitch back. You're supposed to aim for 10 degree pitch up. And beautiful, we get airborne and bring the gear up as quickly as possible. Say goodbye to Mojave and then make sure you don't fly into the mountains, which are pretty much straight ahead of you. The left screen, by the way, that is a, it's an Avidyne system on either side, and I believe that's an Avidyne PFD in the middle. But um, the one on the left, that gives you synthetic vision, so you can actually see the terrain, even although you would normally have no visibility from the aircraft. And there's no cameras when you're flying at speed, because once the landing gear goes away, you don't have uh, any cameras down there. Down the bottom, that is a GRT avionics um, you know, flight display. That's supposed to be a backup if everything else fails, because all that stuff up the top, of course, had to run some custom software for this specific aircraft. For all the detail, there's quite a few things that don't work. Up in the top right, that AOA indicator doesn't work. Uh, on the top left, there's like a drag chute do no, doesn't work. Bottom left, there's like emergency gear deployment. I don't think that's hooked up. And then there's a bunch of circuit breakers on either side. They don't do anything. Don't worry about them. It felt pretty easy to fly, to be honest, but I was wondering if this is because of, like, the control damping system. So I thought I would just, like, turn that stuff off and see if it would make things a bit more difficult. Do it the way Chuck Yeager did it, except without the broken ribs. Okay, so now at the target altitude, headed westbound, time to light up the afterburners and push myself through the sound barrier. The XB-1 has three J85-15 afterburning turbojets. That's the same type of engine used on the F-5 or the T-38. And while the exterior view lets you see the afterburners, the speed on this is only an airspeed. It doesn't give you a Mach meter, so you have to go into the cockpit and use the Mach meter in the top left of the PFD. You can see that I am still subsonic at this point, but trying to level out and get the thing uh, to you know, go to speed. I think I actually had a harder time doing this because I turned off the dampers. Any time you're going up and or down, you're modifying the wing load, and so you're losing a bit of speed due to excess drag. But there we go, 0.97. Keep going, 0.98. Feeling that sound barrier. 1.0. 1.01. You see, now I'm supersonic, and this is the hardest part in theory, but. I guess Microsoft Flight Simulator doesn't really show you just how difficult it would be to fly this thing without all that fancy stuff turned off. And while the boom test only went slightly supersonic, you can make this go a lot faster if you like, but remember, if your sonic boom reaches the ground, then uh, you might be breaking some rules here. The boomless cruise feature that uh, Boom are talking about really depends on you being only slightly faster than the speed of sound and the sound waves or the shock waves get refracted back upwards. If you go too fast, then simply that doesn't work. So anyway, pulling the power back and we got to get in for a landing. But before I did that, I thought, wouldn't it be fun to see if I can spin this thing out of control? And despite turning off the safety features, I could get it to stall. I couldn't get it to spin. I could get it to sort of go like a falling leaf and lose altitude at a ridiculous speed, which 
actually turned out to be quite useful because I didn't fancy gliding all the way down at what the, the two degree glide slope that this thing is supposed to follow. And so since I was right over it, I decided I would aim for the shuttle runway at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. Once you get slow enough, you can put the gear down and the center display starts to give you that camera for landing. And, you know, you just want to aim for like a two to three degree glide slope, I think. Once you come down, you have to get nose high and gently put those wheels onto the surface. So, kind of like that. Then, obviously, you want to hold that front wheel off for a bit because you're going really fast. Let the, you know, aircraft slow down. And once you put that nose gently on the surface, you can begin regular braking to bring yourself to a graceful stop on the center line like a pro. Of course, a pro probably wouldn't have intentionally stalled it at 30,000 feet to see how much altitude he could lose. Also, a pro wouldn't be doing things like this. I may have zero forward visibility, but I can sort of see where the edges of the bridge are and estimate where the surface is. It's not that hard. Also, by the way, this thing does actually do decent aileron rolls. I can't, however, figure out how to change the radio, so it's just constantly giving me weather report from Salinas. So anyway, while I'm violating all these other rules about flying fast and low, I, I kind of want to mention the other thing that uh, Boom announced today, and that is... And this is something called Superpower, where the pitch is they're going to use their Symphony engines in a power station to power AI data centers. Now, you might have heard that there's been a lot of stories about companies being unable to get the power to their data centers. And one of the solutions has been to, well, one of the solutions has been to talk about putting data centers in space, but the solution that's happening now are gas turbine power plants. Essentially, the cores of jet engines connected to generators to generate power for these things. So some people are calling this a pivot, and I don't think it's a pivot at all. It's essentially a way that they're getting some investment funding to cover the development of their engine. Because everybody knows that developing a supersonic airliner is going to be fabulously expensive, and a lot of people doubt that they have the resources on hand to be able to do this. So getting another $300 million to support their engine development makes a lot of sense. We have seen the use of aeroderivative turbine power plants that generally they take the plane engines and they run them at a little lower level so that they can run for longer. Like, they typically run for about two years before they need an overhaul. Your typical jet engine converted to a power plant can produce something between 25 and 50 megawatts, depending upon the specific core. They're not nearly as efficient as a dedicated power plant with a combined cycle system, but uh, they are very easy to bring in and set up. So Boom are promising that they will have a 42 megawatt superpower system available. Uh, there's about an 80% commonality between their power systems and the system designed to run on Overture. The main differences are the one that runs on the ground can also run on natural gas or diesel. It has to have some extra compressor stages on the front because, of course, when you're flying at Mach 1.7, you get a fair amount of compression just from the intake. What they're also telling us is that Mach 1.7 input inflow means that the air temperature is hotter. So their engines are designed to deal with hotter air coming in the front of them. I mean, at least compared to the garden variety jet engines found on airliners. So anyway, in theory, they say this means that they will be able to operate these things at higher power levels without derating them. But that's all for their internal engineers, to be honest. So the, the end user is just going to care about the cost of acquiring them and the cost of running them. Meanwhile, Boom benefits if these systems are installed because they not only get some cash from it, but they also get to see how the engine fares. They get to collect uh, reliability data, maintenance data. This kind of information is great to have because when you're trying to certify an airliner, you want to have as much information as possible to convince those people that are doing the paperwork that your aircraft isn't going to fall out of the sky. Or at least if it does, it's not going to be because the engine failed. But, like, to the skeptics out there, look, I know, Boom are a long way from delivering an aircraft and may or may not have the resources to be able to get there. And while Superpower gets them some money now with the promise of money downstream from now, uh, there's no guarantee that the AI market is going to continue in its current course. The current AI data center build-out frenzy is largely dependent on these AI companies actually getting revenue which justifies this. Furthermore, it's also contingent on 
nobody finding a better way to do AI that needs less hardware. There might be some smart computer scientist that makes a breakthrough that eliminates the need for LLMs or improves deep learning to the point that these massive data centers uh, are overbuilt. But on the flip side, as a you know, coder who grew up in the 1980s programming on an 8-bit micro with a few kilobytes of memory, I honestly wonder if today's generation of coders are actually bothering to optimize their code or just relying on hardware. It is not lost on me that I am very unseriously flying this simulation of a civilian supersonic aircraft around on graphics hardware, which clocks in at something like 48 teraflops. And if we rewind to 2003, the last time we had a civilian supersonic airliner, uh, that would make this hardware faster than the fastest supercomputer at the time. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.